I'm going to be joined by Paul Carden. Morning, Paul. Hiya, Sonia. Morning. I can hear you. I can't see you. Right. I'll have a mess around here and see if I can fix it. I'm so things. sorry we're a bit late, Paul. Yeah. Just a That's all minutes. right. Not a problem. Thank um, you. I, um, I was only given the option to join with video, so um, I need oh. to try and fix things here. I'm very sorry. Let's see. No, don't yeah. worry. I mean, listen, while you're doing that, why don't we carry on talking anyway, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So Not everybody, this is the voice of Paul Carden. <laughs> now, Paul has written an amazingly interesting book called The Return to Bomb Alley, The Falklands Deception. It was... Uh, published March 28th. It's available in many places other than Amazon, as well as Amazon. And Paul, it, it actually charts your, um, your life. You were 22. Um, you, um, you, you joined the um, Royal Navy. And, uh, and well, actually, in February 1976, you joined the Naval Training School. And that was you were encouraged by Blue Peter's uh, That's right. John yeah. Noakes to do That's so. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I saw, I saw um, a switch Blue Peter on one day and John Noakes was climbing uh, the, the mast. They had a huge mast. It was about 150 foot, feet tall at HMS Ganges. And John, John Noakes had gone down with the camera crew. And he's a very brave man, as we all remember. And he, he climbed the mast along with about 70 sailors and he got right to the top. And then the sailor he was with stood on the button at the top and saluted. And all the others stood with their arms outstretched. And it was very impressive to a young, you know, 16 year old me. And I thought, wow, I'd like to uh, give that a go. And I ended up joining. Well, that in its own way is propaganda, isn't it? And, uh, well, and, yes. yeah, and now yes. you realise and you realise it in my Monday co-host. You know yeah. There's a thing that you can say, I'm sorry to interrupt, but no. um, you can say the recruiting sergeant sells dreams, but delivers nightmares. Oh, here we go. Right. Well, let's get into this, Paul. So um, you also <clears throat> sent me an article you'd written in the Light newspaper, which which is brilliant, cuts to the chase. And that is you served in the Royal Navy. Navy. You were a veteran of the Falklands conflict. You're only 22 and you basically have 12 outstanding questions. We're not going to be able to cover them all. But uh, yeah. I mean, essentially what you're actually saying is this was a contrived conflict because of Thatcher's waning popularity. That's right. Yes. Um to sort of set the scene for um, Mrs. Thatcher was elected in May 1979, the first female prime minister uh, and the first European uh, female leader as well. Um, and she came in on a wave of popularity. And then I think the first incident, um, major incident on her watch was the embassy siege, which was in April, May uh, 1980. And she dealt with that quite well, I think. And after that, um, her popularity soared, um, but it's a big but. Um, her economic policies were uh, monetarist and influenced by sort of Friedman and Walters, and they were very uh, unforgiving policies. And we sort of ended up with three million unemployed as time went on. Then we had inflation at eighteen percent, and uh, she was a very divisive figure. Yes. Um, she, she, to try and deal with the problem, she uh, increased taxes and then she was advised by hundreds of um, senior economic people not to do that because it would have an impact on the um, manufacturing base. And we all know, if we look back, uh, that manufacturing and industry was decimated oh, um, yes. during Thatcher's period. But she was warned about that. But I think her middle name was intransigence, you know. Yeah, She indeed. wasn't listening. Indeed. Uh, and you <clears> are <throat> still angry with, well, you say that the failure to report this appropriately by BBC and the UK media still is ongoing. And one yeah. of the first questions you asked was, why was it never reported by the BBC and UK media that 90% of the Falklands Island land, including the vast sheep farms, was owned by absentee landlords resident in the UK and the Falklands Islanders were actually working tenants. Yeah. So, the idea that this was in the islanders' interests is really not exactly how it was, right, Paul? That's right. That's <laughs> right. Um, and I only learned yesterday that the Falkland Islands Company, a director of the Falkland Islands Company, was Dennis Thatcher, Mrs. Thatcher's husband. So his interests were being addressed, and the absentee landlord's interests were being addressed. 
But this was never talked about. It was never reported by the BBC or the media. And um, it sort of um, takes the shine off her claim that the Falkland Islands, Islanders' interest for Paramount. Right. You know, that seemed to have been an invention because she was never talking about their interest there before. No. You know, um, and, and most people weren't aware where the Falkland Islands were, including us. Right. <clears throat> exactly. Tell us what it was like going out to the Falklands. Um, well, we were, uh, I was on HMS Yarmouth and we were um, based, we were in Gibraltar and we were about to go on a, a Far East deployment and we were all, uh, all my shipmates and me were on a high because we were really looking forward to that. We were off to Singapore, uh, we were um, off to the Far East, it would have been fantastic, Malaysia, all that sort of stuff. And we, were actually, we actually set sail in early April. And um, I, I was a leading radio operator. And I was, I was actually in front of the teleprinter when this happened. A message came in, a flash message came in saying, turn around and go and join the HMS Hermes uh, battle group in the Atlantic and then sail down to Ascension Island and then proceed down to the Falklands. Because we, we knew that what had gone on, we knew about the garrison being uh, defeated and the Argentines had, had invaded and... You know, and the next day we were all issued with dog tags, and that's when it really sank in. You know, right. uh, we're going to a war. But you're 22. I mean, yeah. that's that's younger than my daughter, and it's yes. like I cannot imagine. You know, yeah. I mean, basically, no disrespect, but at 22, you were still all but a kid going off to yeah. war. Yeah, I was. I was, and there were younger kids, the younger people than me. There were 16 year olds who oh. just this did just come out of basic training just joined the ship some of them some of them i'm not joking they were in a, a right state you know they were Terrible. very tearful about it you know and the longer it went on uh, we were all hopeful that the, uh, the peace plans that were coming up would work you know we, we didn't it's not that we didn't want to go and do our jobs and you know as they say um, sure but we wanted to uh, i i described it in the book as as a metaphor really it was like we were autumn leaves falling onto a river we were volunteers but we were like autumn leaves falling onto a river, and then that was it. We got swept along on the stream. We got swept along 8,000 miles away and ended up at, at, at the Falkland Islands. You know, we had no say in our, our destination type of thing. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, I mean, I mean, obviously a part of history, but it, it's a history that we've yet to know the truth about. And, and, and we're likely not going to in probably mine and your lifetime, because another right. question you ask, was why was public access to all incoming telegrams sent during the Falklands conflict embargoed until 2052? Why was it, Paul? Any well, ideas? I, th I think the reason is because, um, like I said before, there were peace plans being proposed. Alexander Haig was a sort of go-between um, uh, in that process. And there was one in particular, Peruvian peace plan, which came to fruition just at the end of April and the start of May. So it was the 1st of May when um, Mrs. Thatcher's uh, ambassador in Peru, Charles Wallace, was approached with this peace plan. It was around midday and he would have sent a telegram. Um, it, was, it was a seven point plan, would have sent all the details across to London. That was the 1st of May, crucially. Mm -hmm. And on the 2nd of May, the Belgrano was sunk. Mrs. Mm -hmm. Thatcher later said that it took 17 hours for that telegram to arrive i know i know for a fact that must, must have been a lie i was a leading radio operator i was sending telegrams all the time especially after the conflict because lots of our lads wanted to send telegrams home to the family and tell them that he was still okay and all that sort of thing i knew that telegrams arrived seconds or minutes later Look at and that. for mrs thatcher to claim that it arrived three hours after the belgrana was sunk is a lie i believe and that's why what you said about the telegram, the incoming telegrams being embargoed and no public access until 2052, um, that asks me, everybody's got to ask that question. Yes. What have they got to hide? Exactly. And that is the key thing. Can you remember how much it cost us? Oh, um, well, it, it, do you mean the financial figure? Yeah, yeah, the financial I, I, figure. I, I don't know that. I could research that. It, it will have been in the, oh, it, possibly around a billion. Yeah, would it, it would have been huge. It yeah. would have been substantial. It's, it was a massive task force. It was 100 ships. 
Yeah. It, it, it could have been a number of billions. It was 100 ships with 30,000 um, sailors, airmen and uh, soldiers. And, and what about the whole issue of defence cuts before the war itself? Yeah, yeah that was crucial because I Mrs. Think so. Thatcher... Mrs. Thatcher left the islands looking vulnerable. And it, it, the, Th the Galtieri had his own problems in Argentina. But when he saw Mrs. Thatcher was making defense cuts, and in particular HMS Endurance, she proposed to remove HMS Endurance away from its patrolling waters in the South Atlantic. The Argentinian spotted that straight away. And I found a press article, an Argentinian press article, uh, sort of, um, proclaiming that um, the British don't care about the islands. So <clears throat> everyone's getting the impression in Argentina that if they were, into, were to invade, um, it would not be contested by the British. So I, I feel that Miss Thatcher was playing a game and Galtieri right. fell into the trap. And right. if you read my book, it will become a lot clearer. Exactly. That is called Return to Bomb Alley, The Falklands Deception. I will put a link to it in the comments Thanks, below. Sorry, sorry we you. weren't able to see you, Paul. I yeah. Didn't. Oh, it's that, you're the second person we've had some issues. It's with so point. typical that my I computer know. goes wrong. With I know, and wrong. we did a check, didn't we? But, you know, yeah, we did. it happens. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It's, it's like a radio. And uh, But we really appreciate you joining us because it's yet another deception. And yeah. uh, honestly, Paul, I mean... Uh, Aren't you exhausted? You're 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 somebody who's campaigned no. for a long time, and it is exhausting, isn't it? The amount of corruption and deception that we have to deal with, either at central government or in yes. local authorities. That's right. Well, I'm not exhausted, and I'm I Good want man. I want to keep on fighting these battles, and my battles are not ju not just this one. Uh, I've had a number of employees who've been trying to sack me because I was a whistleblower once at Woodall yeah. Council. They tried to sack me and failed. And then later on, um, I, I, I was a complainant to Cheshire West, Cheshire West and Chester Council. And th the same thing happened. They came along with a load of bogus gross mm -hmm. misconduct charges trying mm -hmm. to sack me. And I beat them and I retired age 50, 12 years ago. And... Um, this, this, it's just in my blood, I think. I'm, I, I hate injustice. I'm like yourself, Sonia. I hate injustice. That's it, isn't it? Once you do, yeah. you, you spot them all. Because they, yeah. they they all, in their own way, sort of link up together. Uh, D says, cheers, Paul. History just repeats. It does. Um, <laughs> Divine Johns is all coming out. And by the way, Craig thinks that you sound exactly like Ringo Starr. I, uh, <laughs> does he? Yes. I, I, Thomas I don't... the Tank Engine. Yeah. <laughs> Into the station. Oh, lovely. Paul, <laughs> listen, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's been a pleasure. Take Thanks good care of yourself. Sonia. Everybody, Paul Cardin, I'll put a link to his book in the description. Take good care of yourself, Paul. Thanks, Sonia. Cheers. Bye, Bye now. Bye. Bye.